you all make Kiddush first? Is this what happens? Well, I'm going to do the full one then. Yeah. What time do we usually start? <clears throat> All right, loves, let's uh, make Kiddush. Rashawn, what? Rashawn Maruvene Yisrael. Doro Tamborito La Uvene Israel Et Tashabat La Sote Tashabat Doro Tamborito La Veni Israel Otile Olam Otile Olam Onesham Shabbat la sot et ha bat le dorotam. Zahor at Yom HaShabbat. Asadonai, Asadonai, Hashem Yetara, Hashem Reuven e Yisrael, et Hashem. Shabbat le dorota olam. Omash vi shavat vaina pash, avad vaina pash, avad vaina pash. Ash te shamru vene Israel et ha shabbat la sot et ha shabbat. Zahor at Yom HaShabbat v'kacho sheshet yamim ta'avot Zusita kol melachtecha ubiyom ha'shevi Shabbat lanu noy Eloecha Lo ta'asech om lacha atav im chavitecha Avdecha v'yamavcha v'yamitecha V'gecha asheh b'sharecha ki sheshet yamim asar noy Et ha'shemayim v'yet ha'aretz את היום ואת כל השבם ויונח ביום השביעי. על כן בירך ארונוי את יום השבת וקדשהו סברי. ברוך את ארונוי אלוהינו מלך העולם בורא פריאן. If we were in an orthodox shul, that's the way the kiddush would have been made. I... I have a major apology to you. I had no idea 
what Torah study meant. Because I see you all have chumashim uh, here. Now, I really did not know. And I prepared a totally different um, session. I mean, totally different. What? Yeah, it's, it's all, I, everything that we're going to be doing this morning, and it may be shorter than usual, you have in front of you, you have 10 pages. Okay? What's that? All right, so a couple of comments. Uh, you know why Rabbi Barris is in uh, Israel today? That's so he did not have to teach Tazria Misoa. <laughs> because it is the most complex, the most challenging, and for a liberal congregation, the least significant. Yes. I mean, the, um, after all, Tazria discusses the impurities of a postpartum mother. And Mitzora, it's a double, uh, it's a double uh, Shabbos. Mitzora deal, ha, deals with all the intricacies of the purification of a leper. So this is, this is one of the, this, this is always skipped for bar mitzvahs. You never have this, all right? You're really? Yeah, I'm curious how he handled it. Yeah. So I did not know that you actually have chumashim, because um, all I was told is that the rabbi usually prepares one sheet. So if he puts well, it's one sheet, I prepared 10. <laughs> but the oh, 10... Yeah, the 10 sheets are our session this morning, and it may very well be much shorter than you're used to. <clears throat> I want to make um, and some more comments. We're going to, those of you who have taken Melton with me know that the method is we read a text and then we discuss it. So I'm counting on you to be interactive today. Um, and I hope that you'll uh, volunteer to read the texts as they come. So a couple of comments as well. How many of you know what the documentary hypothesis is? Is that a word you know? Okay. The documentary hypothesis was created by Julius Wellhausen um, in the late 19th century. And what he said was that the Chumash, the Torah, the five books, are made up of four different documents. Today we don't talk about documents, we talk about sources. And the documents are, can someone tell me what the documents are? J, D, E, and P. The J, of course, refers to those texts that have Yahweh, or as the non-Jews have called it, Jehovah, have, where God is addressed or identified as Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, yod heh vav -He. E are those texts in which God is identified as Elohim, Elohim. D is Deuteronomy. The P is more complex. The P was developed in, between the years 500 and 400 of the um, BCE before the Common Era. And it was the very last of all the documents. And um, so I want to tell you a little bit about it. The, um, all of Leviticus is P, um, because the priests were part of the 
tribe of Levi. Yes? So it's Levit Leviticus. The interesting thing is that the, the word, what is the word in Hebrew for Leviticus? Vayikra, right? Why is it called Vayikra? What? You got to be loud. Yes, that's what it means. But why is the book called Vayikra? The same reason that Breshit is called Breshit, Shemot is called Shemot, Badmidbar is called Bamidbar, and Deuteronomy, the last, is called Devarim, because these are the key words at the beginning. The interesting thing is the Greco-Roman designation of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, um, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are more authentic than the Hebrew words we use. Yes? Oh, there was a bracha that we... Oh, yes, of course. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech olam. So far, we haven't gotten to Divrei Torah anyway. It's Divrei Haskell, so you, there's no bracha for that. All right. So the interesting thing is that the Greco-Roman words are more authentic than the Hebrew that we use. By authentic means that they are the original terms. Thank you for asking. So um, they are Greco-Roman, and they emerged in the Septuagint. The Septuagint is, as many of you know, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. Its history is not very complex. In about the year 250, Ptolemy II in Alexandria, who was building the major library of the world, sent a message to Jerusalem saying, I want scholars who know Hebrew and Greek to come to Alexandria and translate it into Greek. Actually, Septuagint means the 70. Um, there were actually 72, which is very interesting. And this narrative is found in the letter of Aristeus in the Apocrypha. That's where it's found. And it's also found in the, in the Talmud. The Talmud has a very interesting way of dealing with it. The Talmud says that the 72, all of them, made the same mistake. Made the same mistake. Deliberately. Because there were certain words that had they read them or translated them, they would have been an insult to Ptolemy's wife. So they all made the same mistake. That's, that was the miracle in, uh, as recorded in the Talmud. The miracle as recorded in the uh, Apocrypha is that they all produced the same text. And it wasn't 70, it was 72. So the original name of Leviticus was... Torat Kohanim, the law of the priests, the law of the priests. Devarim, for instance, Deuteronomy, the original name was Mishneh Torah, the second Torah. And Maimonides, by the way, for his law book, adopts that term so that people will take 
his law book, which was written in Hebrew, his other stuff was written in, in Arabic, take it very seriously. So that's the origin of Leviticus. And we don't know when exactly the terms Reshit and Vayikra and the, the Hebrew terms that we have for the Sidrot, we don't know when they came into being. It's shrouded in literary history. The oldest Hebrew manuscript extant was the Ben Asher Code, and he lived around 960 of the Common Era. And the Hebrew text that we have called the Masoretic text, namely the final text that the Masoretes, and by the way, they, it comes from the term Masor, to hand down. The oldest one that we have is 960 or so. He was the last of the Masoretes. And in his text, he does use these terms, Bereshit, Vayikra, etc. So we're dealing here with a complex book, a complex um, uh, source. So, for one thing, the priests had a triple responsibility. The first was to assure that the sacrifices were done properly in the temple. The second is to be physicians, and I'm using the word in quotations, because it was their function to determine that sara'at, which we translate as leprosy, it's some kind of a skin disease, that it is handled correctly, and the person who has sara'at is purified. And the last function was to teach monotheism. Prior to the advent of monotheism, there was something called henotheism. Henotheism meant that when I'm in Eretz Yisrael, in the land of Israel, I worship Yahweh Elohim. But when I go out of Eretz Yisrael and I go in the surrounding countries, there are other gods which I, as a guest, may be compelled to worship as well. So, henotheism was the beginning. Eventually, the Jewish nation, the best word for them is the B'nai Yisrael, B'nai Yisrael, developed a pure monotheism. And this was done by the priests and taught by the priests. For example, um, after Wellhausen uh, taught these four, these four documents, people, and we don't know who they were, developed a Bible called the Regenbogen Beagle, the Rainbow Bible in which each of the documents had its own color. And more recently, there are scholars, his name is Friedman, has done it in a more modern way. So for example, um, P, which we are in the middle of, is always a deep blue. But it's not only in Leviticus. Um, the beginning of Genesis, which is the creation account, is deep blue. Well, even though the term for God is Elohim, this teaches a very pure form of monotheism. How does God create the world? And we're going to encounter that later. 
How does God create the world and people? I need an answer. Speech. Exactly. Speech. Vayoma Elohim Yehi Or. Let there be light and there's light. We shall make the human being in our image. That's the first account. There's a second account shortly afterwards. And how does the God there, and it's Yahweh, how does God create the human being? Yeah, he breathed, but what did he breathe into? What? He made mud pies. He made mud pies, and out of it molded the human being and blew in the breath of life. So that would not have been the orientation of P. P was far more puristic as opposed to mythical. And so that was the last of the functions of the priesthood. So I need to tell you already, I apologize, that I didn't realize that we were going to study uh, with Humashim, that we are going to do, in, in my text, I have a section from Tazria. Um, this, the other one, Mitzorah, I'm not going to go, and I haven't prepared, all the vast details of the discovery of leprosy. We have some physicians in the room. I don't know if we have dermatologists. Um, I know we have some physicians that the, what? I think I have to make my hearing aids louder. One second. This is very high tech. Yeah. One second. Maimonides, eleven thirty, uh, eleven thirty-five to twelve o five. And that was when he did did uh, write the Mishnah Torah. I want to add something that uh, my, as long as you mention it, he wasn't popular because he cut the legs out of all the other rabbis who were his competitors. Because if you could read Mishnaic Hebrew, which is not a complex Hebrew, it's much more simple than biblical Hebrew, then you didn't need to go to any rabbis for any questions that you had about any aspect of life. So, um, and he, the, the other thing, as I said before, the other pieces were written in Arabic. The reason was that Arabic was the lingua franca at that period of time. They lived in the midst of Muslims, and um, so he wrote, he wrote in Arabic. So... When coming back to, we are going to do a little bit about Tazria. When we come to Metzora, we're going to read just a few, a few verses because what I have prepared is the sin that causes leprosy. Leprosy is caused by a sin, a sin, S-I-N. And so that's what I, I have dealt, dealt here. I deal with the sin that causes leprosy. Okay. So now let's read Tazria. By the way, before we do it, um, uh, the, the opening in Hebrew, would someone read the Hebrew? And then we'll read the English. Okay, stop there. And somebody read the English, please. Speak to the Israelites who is us. When a woman in childbirth bears a male, she shall be impure seven days. She shall be impure until the time of her circumcision and her separation. 
Okay. So first of all, let's deal with the Hebrew Tazria Zera. Tazria. It comes from the root of that means a seed, a seed, you know, like you plant. So giving birth is like seeding the world, or in this instance, seeding the Jewish people. Tazria is the verb, and therefore it is a very, very powerful statement. Now, there is, uh, there is this issue of her being impure. You have any in reactions, and I would love to hear some, as to why the ancient world may have considered a woman who was postpartum impure. Help me. What? Yes, there is bleeding. Yes. The entry, yes. Again, repeat that, please. There's, thank you, there's something else um, that the ancient world noted or that women noted, that when they were healthy, they bled. And that was already mystical to the contemporary world, that when she was healthy, she bled. So the blood of her menstruation caused an impurity probably because the men at the time didn't know how to handle this kind of uh, issue. All right. Um, one other thing. All right, let's read on. Somebody uh, pick up the Hebrew, Uvayom Hashmini. And the English? Someone? On the eighth day, the flesh of her corpse was judged fit to have. She shall remain in a state of blood purification for three days. She shall not touch any consecrated thing, nor any sanctuary, until her period of purification is completed. Okay. Now, on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin, foreskin shall be circumcised. The passage in Genesis is Genesis 17 that deals with the Brit, with the covenant that God makes with Abraham, and it involves circumcision. Guess what source that is. It is P. It is P. Even though it's in Genesis, it's P, because P is concerned about two things. First, the purity of monotheism, and to assert the covenant. Because there were Jews, or B'nai Israel who were not circumcising their children. During the Greco-Roman period, there were Jews who did epispasm. I think I got the word right, right? An epispasm is 
to take the foreskin and pull it down so that it look, doesn't look like it's uh, a circumcision. Because in the Greco-Roman, I think I got it right, um, the Greco-Roman world, the, the games were done with nudity. And so for Jews to participate in the games, they had to circumcise, uh, they had to remove the circumcision. Um, there's been a lot this week in the news about um, Dave, the sculpture of David, right? And um, if you take a look at the, if any of you seen the sculpture of David? Is it circumcised or uncircumcised? uncircumcised. It's uncircumcised because the sculptor did not want, that's Michelangelo, did not want to offend the people who would come to see his work. So it was always an issue. It was always an issue. So this looks as if it were just thrown in. I mean, on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Doesn't have anything to do with Tuma, uh, defilement, and tame to remove the refinement. Um, I always talk with my son before I do these things because he's the biblical scholar in the family. <laughs> no, he is. He has a, he has a serious PhD from, um, from Brandeis in ancient Near Eastern languages and Bibles. So, I always confer with him, and he just threw out the following comment that the, the state, the constant state is tahara, is purity, is purity. The, so it takes an act of defilement to affect the purity, to affect the purity. So she shall remain in a state of blood purification for 33 days. She shall not touch any consecrated thing nor enter the sanctuary until a period of purification is completed. So I asked my son, it's a couple of days ago, what is the source of these impurities and purifications? What is the literary source? So he couldn't tell me. However, what he did say is that all the nations surrounding Israel had the same laws. From Ugaritic, which is the, a language akin to Hebrew in Lebanon in the north, to the Egyptians in the south, to the, well, it's, it's not Jordanians now, um, to the west, they all had the same kinds of laws with regard to um, the postpartum women, which is fascinating. So, the um, tahor, I'm repeating myself, tahor being pure is the default constance, the default. It's tuma that changes that perfect state. So I want you to note that this is all about the birth of a male. Turn the page. Need some Hebrew again. What? I think there's three people in the room who would benefit from reading Hebrew. All right. Some of you read Hebrew, other than. All right, so read it. You went to Yeshiva. English? All 
All right. So what's going on? Why is, if she gives birth to a female, why is it twice as long as impurity as a male? What? <laughs> what? Yes. Okay. Um, that's a biological answer, no, which is fine. Any other answers as to why the Torah Im imposes a greater period of impurity for a female? It's interesting. Interesting. Any other any other reasons? Yes. Yeah, you need to talk super loud. I think of the word being considered like they're they're creating a bad reputation. Yes, for sure. But the question still remains, why is um, um, why is the period of Tuma twice as long for a female at birth as a male? Yes. Use your outside voice. Here, you should use microphone. So I'm going to flip it. Can you, is this better? Again. Is this better? Okay. I'm going to flip it and say, and it's not in the text, but maybe it's more about the new life and the new soul, or it's as about, as much about, the new life and the new soul. And so maybe the word impurity, for me, would throw off that scent a little bit, but if you think about it as a new life, you want to protect this new life, and you want it to be the new standard bearer of monotheism in its purest form. And so maybe it's the, you know, euphemism, biblical way of separating the mother and the child, the new child, the new soul from everything else because they're so tender and they've just gone through a major event so that they are not somehow contaminated if they go out in public. That would be... Oh, an idea. Thank you. Yeah, pass it down. Yeah, I, I, I don't have an explanation for your question, but the reality is more males are born, but they more males die in the uh, period around birth. Interesting. So I don't know how to weave that into your story, but that's a biological fact. I seem to remember that uh, it's not infrequent that female babies actually bleed uh, at the t when they yeah post postpartum and I'm wondering whether the purification is there for uh, not only for the fact that this is another woman that can bleed but is bleeding and therefore the purification process has to take care of two people not one interesting I love these answers yeah because she has become two sources of blood after she is born, there will be a source of menstrual blood and birth blood. These are great answers. I had a, um, another answer that it's, it was designed by a patriarchal society. And um, there was a preference for males. I mean, that's mine. I think you all came up with better answers. But that, I would think, may be one of the reasons. There's something else that I want to bring you back to the first page, um, where it says, Ad Malot Yumei Tahara, or enter the sanctuary until the period of purification is completed. It's interesting, the rabbis of the Talmud see that as permitting sex during this period because of the word tahara, because of the word purification. 
Um, so they suggest that during this period in Dmei Tara, or the blood of Tara, the blood of purification, is permits, permits sex during this period of time, which normally would not be permitted during menstruation. Um, so I want to ask you one other thing. What applicability does this have for today? Yes. Good. Oh, by the way, the rabbis note in reading this that the child is pure. The child is not made tame. The child is born tahor, and even though the mother may become impure, the child is not, which is typical about Judaism. Um, and we may, we, I think we're going to encounter it, but I'm, I'm going to anticipate it. Um, in what religion does the child, is the child born impure? In Christianity. Yes, original sin um, emerges from the sexual act, from the sexual act, and is passed down through the generations, how is original sin eliminated? <coughs> Baptism. Baptism. There is, there is a, um, a passage in the Talmud in which the, um, the snake copulates with Eve. Copulates with Eve, and um, and the issue is the issue is not eliminated except for those who have gone to Sinai. Those who have gone to Sinai have eliminated the taint, the zuhama, which is the Hebrew here the taint or sexual taint that, um, that the snake, the serpent, imparts. All right. Um, okay. Now, I asked a reason, I asked for reasons why the difference between the, um, uh, between the male and the female, we are not the only ones who ask that question. Turn to page three. And um, I'll read the Hebrew in this case. Shalu talmidav et rabbi shum ben yochai mipnei ma'amra Torah yoledet Mevia korban amalahen bishash shikurot le led kufzot nishbat shalot tizakak levala lefichach amra torah tavi korban. The issue is why does the woman bring a sin offering? We have it over in the other page. She she brings a sin offering. And why? Well, we're going to see something here. Would someone read the English, the students? For her, she'd like to marry Bob, obviously. <laughs> All right, read the English, the students. The students of Rabbi Shimeon Ben 
Yahai asked him, for what reason does the Torah say that a woman after childbirth brings an offering? Yeah, that's a sin offering. Right, go he ahead. He said to them, at the time that a woman crouches to give birth, her pain is so great that she impulsively takes an oath that she will never engage in intercourse with her husband ever again, so that she will never again experience this pain. Therefore, the Torah says that she must bring an offering for violating her oath and continuing to engage in intercourse with her husband. So, I mean, the implication is a period of time after um, giving birth, 66 days, and she engages in sexual congress again. She has violated her oath that she's never going to have sex again. So that's a sin for violating your oath. Therefore, she brings a sin offering. So I find this so fascinating. I love whenever this I'm, Torah I'm portion sorry. comes up. I love when this Torah portion comes up because I find it so fascinating that, you know, even today, um, society and particularly men are so fascinated, repulsed, um, confused, whatever, about the process of how women carry a child and give birth. And to me, it's all kind of part of a reconciliation of the fact that men can't do it, so they have to either make it something bad or mystical or something because otherwise why wouldn't they be able to do it because after all at this period of time they could do everything and women could really not do much um but as a midwife to me it's like and this is what i would tell my patients it's like the most powerful thing you will ever do in your life and i think somehow the men kind of realize that and felt like they had to come up with all these, and if people are still doing it today. Why does it happen? Why do, can women only do it? Why does it go wrong? Why does it go right? Um, and I don't think we know any more about that today than we knew then. We know how to fix things and stuff, but I just find it all fascinating because it's some I mean, kind of... Think it's uh, I nice think they don't do it because nice they loud, couldn't please. do it. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah. Don't get her started. <laughs> just, wait, 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 wait. just to and add in there. <laughs> you chose her. You can't be stereophonic <laughs> because the hearing aids. No, no, no I, uh, to follow up on that, this is very much a male perspective in all of this. And this the reading that you just gave us is particularly interesting to me because the men are concerned with being able to have intercourse with their wives. And if a woman is bleeding or she has just given birth, she doesn't want necessarily to have intercourse, but the men have to find some excuse to say she has to anyway because that's her obligation. And uh, Michael's back there. But it's very much a male perspective. Women would not say these things, I don't think. So on a somewhat separate uh, uh, thought, uh, many people, me included, commit sins, and it's one thing to have to um, uh, atone for or make a, a chatat uh, offering for uh, a sin that you've already committed, but uh, to have to make a chatat offering for a sin that you are going to do in the future, anticipating, that seems like a big burden. <laughs> So I, I didn't come this morning expecting to be reminded of the birth of my three children. Um, but at the time, um, my oldest was born, uh, who's 42. Um, we were just beginning to get deeply into natural childbirth, right? And, and so there was this prolonged labor and and Judy made it almost all the way through and water broke and shortly after Brian was born and I cried 
Yeah, right? Because, because I was completely vulnerable in this moment. Completely vulnerable. And yet I was witness to the most powerful, most sacred thing that we could do, which was to bring another child into the world. Now, men do not like to be vulnerable. Men do not even like to acknowledge that vulnerability is a possibility. And so to be there at that moment and to witness this and to cry, you know, I think we would do, you know, just about anything to avoid that moment. And yet the process of natural childbirth, with, which brought males into the delivery room and made them part of the... And then the, then the uh, obstetrician said, would you like to cut the umbilical cord? Which was, you know, I had some small role in this. I think this is all about vulnerability. This is all about this is all about mm, not being put in a vulnerable place. Thank that, you for this personal whoops. I I may want to make a comment, you know, I've been around thank God for a few years. I'm 88. My um, oldest grandchild turned 28 yesterday. She will be ordained, I just have to, you know, do it. She'll be ordained a rabbi in May. She's married to a rabbi. Her father is a rabbi. Her father-in-law is a rabbi. We've got them all around. Um, on the personal level, I remember when she was born. And I remember my son, my son, my oldest is 62. I was not permitted to be in the birthing room. Not permitted. But for my two daughters subsequently, I was permitted. And I experienced, I may be more open to vulnerability than others, but I experienced the, uh, the enormous miracle of what was taking place. It is, yes. <clears throat> I think the mystery of childbirth is something that we all encounter in every generation. But I'd like to focus on a different portion of that, what was read. I'd like to focus on the oath. Indeed, the priests take oaths very, very seriously. In fact, the whole tractate, Nazir, of the Talmud deals with oaths. How, what is a valid oath? How do you reverse an oath? Well, how do you uh, uh, repent for an oath? So I think they're focusing on the oath part of this. One is an oath un, um, unacceptable, and this is one of the circumstances. This oath is made under stress, and therefore uh, is uh, not a relevant oath. By the way, the um, tractate that deals with oaths in the Talmud is called Nidarim, oaths. And um, also that a husband has the power to eliminate an oath of his wife. Yes. So that's exactly what I was thinking, that I have a problem with what we just read because of the portion of oaths, because of nedarim. There are many cases where they will say, oh, that oath isn't really valid because you didn't mean it, or it was hyperbole, or a husband can nullify. And to me, when I read this part where a woman brings a sacrifice because she might have broken an oath because childbirth was so awful that she said, I'm never doing that again. It, to me, there's, it just, there's no, it, it's written by all men and there's no consideration whatsoever because you can go back to Netarim and there's all these loopholes, but they don't put one in here for this. They could have said from the time, you know, she's doubled over until three days after anything she says can't be valid or some some ridiculous thing like that. And if she wants to re-up it, she has to say it a week later. There's all this stuff in Netarim who have all these types of conventions not in here. I have a big problem with this.
All right, so let's go to the next page. Um, I'd simply call it more on the postpartum mother bringing a sin offering. We can uh, forget the Hebrew. Would someone read the English, please? Page four. The idea that postpartum impurity is the result of original sin uh -huh. was further built upon by Rabbi Ephraim of Lunchitz. 1550 to 1619, in his commentary on the Pentateuch, Kelly Yakur. Yeah, does uh, Rabbi Barris ever use Kelly Yakur? Uh, yes. He does. Um, so, yes, okay, it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's a great one. Go ahead. I say that all of this stems naturally from the ancient sin, as it says, and she, shall be, she will be purified from the source of her blood. For the ancient sin of Eve is the source which opened all of these impure bloods. For all women need purification for the ancient sin from which the impurity and the filth spread across the world and caused all who are born a seven-day impurity. Okay. Thank you. Look when Ephraim of Lunchitz um, lived. 1550-1619. What was the prevalent culture. Christianity. 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 And you have here one of the great scholars of his time is affected by Christianity to the point where he has to indicate that the impurity comes as a result of the sin of Eve. I want to mention that the influence of, we always talk about Judaism, how it influences Christianity. Over the years, Christianity also influences Judaism. So, for instance, there is a narrative about the Akedah, um, Ephraim ben Yaakov of Bonn has a poem in which Isaac is sacrificed and brought back to life. Resurrection. He's, he is sacrificed and God's tears come down on the earth and he's resurrected. Christianity. 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 Um, also, in um, 10th century, Chai Gaon, um, in Babylonia, uh, there were two great le Jewish leaders. One was the Gaon, and this was usually in the town of Sura, and the other one was the Exilarch, the one who was in charge of the political life of the Jewish people. So Chai was a great intellectual, and he wrote a number of chuvot, uh, responses. People would ask him questions, send money with it. I mean, not for himself, for the yeshiva. And, and um, he would respond with a responsum. He has an interesting responsum in which he deals with the mother of the Messiah. The mother of the Messiah, and when the Messiah is going to be born, guess what happens in the heavens? A star. A star. He does it deliberately. I mean, talk about the influence of Christianity. In all of these instances, you have great scholars who admit to the influence of the community. Okay, um, page five, uh, someone read the English. I'll continue. It is, it is taught in a baraita. Yeah, I just want to make sure that you know what a baraita is. I didn't expect it. Um, Yehuda Hanasi, Judah the Prince, um, 
edited, redacted the Mishnah, which was the first code of Jewish law after the Torah, in Sipporo, in Sepphoris, which is north east in the Galilee, all right? He was an autocrat. He and his committee was an autocrat because he chose those passages in the Talmud that he agreed with. <laughs> and that be very vague. Good starting point. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Because my library just told me I could pick up a book. <laughs> um, so he selected those passages throughout the Talmud that he agreed with. And it became the Mishnah. And it influenced everything, the entire Talmud. However, there were passages of equal antiquity that he left out. Those are called Baraitot. Baraitot. And they were assembled in another compilation called the Tosefta, which means the addition. I'll give you an example. In the 10th chapter of Sanhedrin, you have the following words. Kol Yisrael yesh lahem chelek ve'olam haba. All Israel has a place in the world to come. Is that somewhat xenophobic? Mm -hmm. Because it says all Israel. Well, there happens to be a parallel passage in the Talmud that Yehuda Hanasi deliberately left out. But it's in the Tosefta. By the way, the Tosefta slavishly follows the order of the Mishnah. And what does it say? And we liberal Jews love it. Chasidei umot ha'olam yesh lahem chelik bi'olam haba. The righteous of all nations have a place in the world to come. So that is exact response to Yehuda Hanasi in this case. Uh, the Tosefta was probably um, assembled around the year 300, the Mishnah about the year 200. Okay, okay. so we're in Baraita. In a Baraita that Rabbi Meir would say, for what reason does the Torah say that a menstruating woman is prohibited from engaging in intercourse with her husband for seven days. It is because of a wo if a woman were permitted to engage in intercourse with her husband all the time, her husband would be too accustomed to her and would eventually be repulsed by her. Therefore, the Torah says that a menstruating woman shall be ritually impure for seven days during which she is prohibited from engaging in intercourse with her husband, so that she will, when she becomes pure again, she will be dear to her husband as at the time when she entered the wedding canopy with him. Any reaction? <laughs> what? I think it's a romantic response. <laughs> yeah. All right, there's a little bit... But the there's had multiple wives in those days. Yeah. So, you know, you can't have other choices. True. All right. Well, you know, this is, the, this is our Sidra. So I'm trying, to, I'm trying to somehow bring a Sidra that deals with all these intricacies of Tahor and Tameh, of purity and purity, with a little bit of life here. Yeah, I'm sorry that I don't didn't that I didn't follow your usual pattern with the Chumash. Okay, the change is good. What? Okay. <laughs> Can I have somebody read the bottom, which is very I think very interesting, which I also. All right, someone. All right, read it slowly. The students of Rabbi Dostai, son of Rabbi Yanai, asked him, for what reason is it the norm that a man pursues a woman for marriage, but a woman does not pursue a man? Uh, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Rabbi Dostai answered them by citing a parable. Rabbi Dostai answered them by citing a parable of a person who lost an item. Who searches for what? Certainly the owner of the lost item searches for his item. The item does not search for its owner. Since the first woman was created from the body of the first man, the man seeks that which he has lost. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we have to comment too much about that. <laughs> but, you know, it's... It, it's um, okay. So the wife is property. In a way, okay. Oh, good, we have... All right. We may be finishing earlier than usual. We'll see. All right, Mitsora. What? Ten o'clock. What? Ten o'clock. You finish at ten? Yeah. I thought we finished at nine at ten thirty. No. Oh man. Oh, this is too good. <laughs> I worked so hard on this. <laughs> so I mean, all right. Um. All right, we're just going to take a couple of pages. All right, somebody read the English, please, on page six. And, and the Lord, Lord spoke to Moses, saying, whatever he said in Hebrew, this shall be the Torah of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall look, and behold, if the disease of leprosy is healed in the leper. This is the Torah for all kinds of diseases of leprosy and patch. And for the leprosy of a garment and of a house and for a swelling and for a scab. How do I get into this? And for a bright spot to teach when it is unclean. And when it is clean, this is the Torah of leprosy. Yeah, I want to make a point that Sarat in the older translations was leprosy. I mean, most of the English, it, it is more accurately some kind of contemporary scholar, some kind of skin disease. But now the next page is the transformative page. Someone read it, please. This is the transformative passage in which Lashon Hara, gossip, is the sin that brings about leprosy. Um, one other comment, because I know that you, uh, some of you go to uh, Minyan. When we, when we are at the, pa the passage in which we deal with um, those whom we want to pray for who may be ill. Um, one of the songs is El Na Rafana La. Oh God, please heal her. And that comes at the end of this passage, 1213. Moses, in spite of his sister, talking badly about Sipporah, being an African woman, in this case, Moses prays to God and says, El na rafana la, O God, please heal her. Well, I guess we're not going to do much about Lashon Hara. Thank you for the opportunity of teaching you Torah. Well, it's a little different than you usually do, but... <laughs>